So, hello everyone. Uh, just to be clear, huh? That's about that, child. Are you sure you're in the right room? Stand by and to Rome and so, huh? Everything right? And to pour a bit more oil into the fire, I'm Christian Heldstab. Heldstab in German means hero and stick or sword. So I'm the mighty knight converting you here to uh, Agile, and if I would have two coconuts, I would simulate it up here. But, uh, but hold on, hold on. I'm Swiss, huh? <laughs> so I'm neutral. It's not my war. It's not my war. <laughs> and I'm actually not religious about Agile and Agile Manifesto and so on. I'd rather see it as a nice tool to work with and to be quite productive with it. So let's start with it. Where's my, here's my, my one. So um, I'm also a ski instructor, of course. As a Swiss, you ski, of course. I mean, yeah. And there I actually learned that complex motion, and remember that word complex, complex motion is something that you not just analyze and then implement and just straight away can do. It's something that you have to learn by doing. And even you as a trainer, and he said that as well, Andy before me, uh, you have to be a good example and lead by, by doing these things by yourself. So I did, uh, trained a lot of children. Uh, I was almost 50 years, I was a trainer of, of these little guys and, and wanted to become, bring them up to the superstar of, of skiing. Well, uh, well, it wasn't that successful, but at least a couple of them are quite good skiers. And there's stuff like things, this happens that here you see my colleague and his son, and the son actually, yeah, I tell him, I'm kind of his trainer, his customer, say, look, it's quite nice what you do, but you might have to bend your knee a bit more, this one, huh, to have more uh, grip on your edge of the, of the ski. So try to do that. And he thinks about it and, yeah, okay, give him a bit of time. I do that, do that a couple of, of, of turns, and then, well, give me a feedback. Is it, is it better so? And say, yeah, well, actually, it's probably a bit too, too much. Do it a bit less. Oh, okay, I try it, I try it, adapt, huh? I give him feedback, now it's perfect, actually. Then we go to the next state. You see already this iterative thing, and that somehow reminds quite often in my head, uh, it's also true for business, isn't it? Wrong side, ooh. So I'm also a software engineer and a business analyst. I changed that from the slides. Huh? And my, my boss told me, well, you have to say that. And you're also, a <laughs> <laughs> and you're also an agile coach. Ooh, yeah. Well, normally to my relatives, I say I'm a software engineer or a, a requirements engineer because that's the thing they understand. If I say, well, I'm an analyst or I'm a coach, well, do you do any real work at all? Uh, hmm, OK. So I work at Silke, it's a Swiss company, has a branch in, in London as well. We do software engineering, uh, product engineering, but also uh, business consulting. And the, this way you actually see in a lot of projects and see in a lot of domains. And telecommunication have quite often similar problems to, to finance or, or engineering in industry has also quite similar uh, needs than, than others have. So over this time, I was actually first working as a developer, and quite often um, I then became this or got this this big uh, specifications over the of a project of a product product I have to implement over the next couple of uh, months, and I said, "Oh my God! First of all, I don't understand your language, and it's quite a bit. And are you sure it takes me just three months? Okay, wow, crazy." Um, so then after a while I actually become, became the, the business analyst, more the guy who actually writes the, the requirements down by himself. And, and all over this time we, we, we struggled so many times with this interaction between a business analyst or business people and, and developers, guys who, who do the work later on. Of course the, the analysts do the work as well, but yeah, you know, it, it always depends in which situation you are. You always blame the others, uh, they are lazy. Um, so we actually learned to get a lot. And things that I learned over this time, I would like to present you here. So those are really the things that I think are important from, from my experience. So there is the Agile Manifesto, of course. 
There are two frameworks of it, Scrum, Kanban, you should know about. Uh, then I go to the Big Bang Theory. Probably someone knows the, the, the series on TV. I have to uh, make it a bit uh, easier there for you. Then we go to Adapt, and then I tell you a thing that you probably, uh, yeah, you should hold on, on your chair about that. So I tell you that information is not knowledge. And that's something if you have, if you're going to take just one thing out of that uh, talk, that's the one. Then another truth, maybe something for a cocktail party later on, silos are for farmers. <laughs> Not for projects, they are for farmers. So that's another thing. Then stay close. Uh, we are talking about product owners and stories. Does that make sense? OK, let's go to work then, huh? We should have properly. So, uh, the root cause of all the problems, huh? the Agile Manifesto. Unfortunate uh, developers, people creating software came up with this, this idea in, in two, 2001. They gathered around and they did brainstorming, did all actually the things we do as well as business analysts, and came up with, with a lot of things. So individuals, processes, customers, contract negotiation, and then they compared each other or these things and prioritized them. And they said actually, well, individuals and interaction that's a bit more important than probably processes and tools. And somehow that's appealing, yeah? We as business analysts, we like interaction and we like to, to work with people, isn't it? Processes, okay, well, tools. Well, uh, software engineers are quite keen on tools, that's right, yeah. Uh, working software over documentation, hmm? yeah? Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. How nice is it to work directly with a customer instead of working with his legal department, isn't it? Or responding on changes over following a plan. Plan. Well, when I was a, a ski instructor, I, of course, had my overall plan as well, but it never worked out. It never worked out. It was always little changes here and there. The weather was bad. Something else happened. I think that's just life, isn't it? That's the way it is. And the Agile Manifesto, really, I'm not religious about it. And if someone of you is, I send Debbie after you. I will do that, <laughs> I promise. Um, just use it as a, as a little exercise and, and think about your current project and use this Agile Manifesto kind of a checklist. And if you see, well, yeah, yeah, unfortunate, we do a lot of contract negotiation, even more than we, we collaborate with the customer. Maybe that's a smell. Maybe that's something that you should uh, have an eye on. If there is something I can actually do and make better, make different. So there are also 12 principles. Uh, one of is changing, welcome changes, even late, there is a harness for that. Well, that sounds actually great, yeah? There are no, you, you don't have to bring in change requests, you can actually just make changes. That would be great. The market change, another requirement comes up, well, that would be great. We're looking at that, how is that possible? Then business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. Well, you know, business people are busy. Huh? How should that work? Well, at this position, you as a business analyst come in. Someone who represents a bit the, the, the business, has an understanding, an overall picture. Then the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within the team is face to face. Well, can we not just write documents? No, no. And that's the thing you take out, hopefully, from that talk. Um, we quickly look at, that was the ma ma manifesto, we quickly look at two frameworks. There are many out there, there are many. The most popular are probably Scrum and Kanban. So Scrum, who is familiar with Scrum? Who has seen that picture? Okay, quite far a lot. Um, it's, it's quite, you, quite often used in IT projects, isn't it? So someone, uh, I call him a superhero, the project owner, somehow gets information from everyone, uh, executives, users, stakeholders, and puts together work for us to do. Well, I already told you, a superhero somehow, we probably as business analysts has to, have to support him. So he puts all the things he, the team has to do within a backlog. 
he makes sure that actually the, the things at the top are the most, the most important and they are actually quite on a good level in terms of how clear they are. They are actually quite good analyzed already. So the team then actually uh, picks a couple of them and breaks them into little tasks and say, okay, we think after the, uh, over the next two to three weeks, we actually can achieve these things. So they do a task breakdown and they go into an, an interaction, uh, into a sprint over maybe two to four weeks. They meet each other daily, they talk about what could we do, uh, what, what was I doing, uh, what's the next step we, we pick up. They have um, this, this called burn down charts, they visualize their things on a board. Quite nice actually. And I as a business analyst, I like this stuff. It's, it's the kind of, you know, we, are, we like post-its, we like facilitate stuff, isn't it? We, we are some kind of visual thinkers, isn't it? So I, I do like these things. Uh, I do like to support them here um, and make it visible what, what the state is. And then after this uh, period, after this sprint, well, the team shows their work. And that's quite valuable. I actually can all bring all my buddies and the uh, vice president of finance and someone else to this demonstration of the tool what they already have achieved, and he sees, okay, wow, you created quite a nice report here. Can I have it daily? Okay, and says, okay, yeah. Well, talk to this product owner. We might have a slot, so yes, why not doing that daily? And he says, yeah, well, yeah, we can do that in the next sprint. So, ooh, finance director says, ooh, wow, you're quite an amazing team. Yes, we know. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and the team itself also goes then into a retrospective and thinks how they did their job over the last period. And they have a retrospective and they try to adapt. Maybe they have missed out test data. Maybe they haven't uh, talked to customers or haven't talked to the business analyst in a proper way. So they actually try to, to improve their way of working from sprint to sprint. So I really like it. It's something that you can it, it visualizes status. Every spring leads normally to a deliverable. So we, we walk about, we, we talk about a walking skeleton. So you have a skeleton who is already walking and you add now the flesh on the bones. Um, then the, the team, and that's amazing actually, already gets feedback. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Well, it's also good to know when you struggle. It's probably better if you know that after two weeks than after two years, isn't it? Um, the team improves, uh, the product owner can decide, product owner in brackets, huh? maybe that's a consortium, that's a, a team who does that. Um, and then the team is also highly focused, so we, we leave them alone for this period of time. So they focus on themselves and task switching, well that's probably something for managers, but developers, they don't like that uh, and it's not efficient. So uh, here, that's one. So that's an example of a backlog. I just got married a couple of weeks ago. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> here it is. Uh, I shouldn't hide it. I shouldn't hide it. <laughs> and pardon? Yeah, here's all my money I, I have left. <laughs> okay. So I, we actually planned. Oops. Sorry. Sorry. We we actually planned our wedding as well in a kind of backlog. Huh? We. We, we noted down what's important, what's in progress. Uh, we had troublemakers. Huh? We, we lost the musician from the church. Ooh. Uh, someone had to take care of it. Uh, we, we marked who is responsible for what. Huh? And then we could actually visualize and, and see, OK, we are probably can make it until the wedding day. Huh? That's a deadline you can't miss. No, it's, that would be the worst thing, actually. And, and something else I learned as well, even though you can actually evolve the board, huh? it can, can be, become quite fancy. Don't, don't do it too much, huh? don't push it. It's about your fiance, huh? she doesn't like it. So it's kind of okay, but as soon as it starts to get freaky, no way, yeah. So that's about uh, Scrum. Why is that working this way? Sorry. Okay, the other framework is Kanban. Kanban is a kind of, you visualize a process. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of process. You can even take the process you have for doing your work. Uh, it's actually quite nice if you think about the steps you're doing for any piece of work you do. Through what kind of steps is it going? 
And we just did it a couple of weeks ago with, in, in a project and we had, oh bloody hell, we have 13 steps to bring something from the beginning until it's implemented. And it had so many buffers in between and stuff laid there around for, for weeks, for months. Oh my God, somewhere there is, is a bad smell, huh? So on Kanban is exactly doing this. So you have kind of uh, columns here. So here we have the analysis column, we have the development column, we have acceptance, and then it goes into production. And you see, obviously, Someone prepares stuff which you can actually pull into analysis. Someone in analysis, most likely a business analyst or requirements engineer or someone who, who likes to do analysis, uh, works it out, breaks it down into little things that could be executed. And then a developer takes the bits which are done and works on it. He also marks it if there is a blockage somewhere. Huh? He marks it this way. Uh, and as soon as he thinks it's done, he places it into the done column. He doesn't push it to the acceptance because there someone, probably a tester or maybe even me as a business analyst, uh, pulls it from here and analyze or uh, make sure that it is properly implemented. And if that is done, it goes in the done column and then into production. You see as well uh, at the top here these numbers. This is the work in progress limit. So you try to limit the things which are in here to that number, three, three, and two. Even the guy who prepares stuff doesn't have to prepare more, more than two. So the good things about Kanban is uh, it will not change any existing process, but will show bottlenecks. I'll show you that on the next slide. Uh, it also visualizes blockages and, and dependencies to, to, uh, to external sources, as we saw here on, on that one. Uh, that's an, a blockage. And if you have a, a wall full of these red stickers on it, and, and you show, and you bring the customer uh, or the finance director who has to decide on something or has to give you input on something and bring it to the wall and say, look, that's the situation. Those are the things which are blocked because of you. That, that's great. I think, yeah, again, I'm a visual person, and I like to show people like finance directors or so, such visual things because they say, wow, you guys are sharp. Yeah, that's great. That's the way I like it to see. Um, it allows to have a steady pace. It's nothing that you have two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, but it's something that comes in and you take the next thing, comes in, takes the next thing. Um, the poor delivery, continuous delivery. And it's, again, it's not uh, a push, it's rather a pull to so take something new in. And if possible, stick on this work in progress limits. So what could actually happen when, when you stick on this? So obviously here we have a situation that development has done all their work and they can't actually pull in something new because there is a problem on the other side here. So what are we doing is actually we swarm into that area. So maybe there's a problem with test data. We can't test that feature because test data is missing. Well, maybe I, as a business analyst, have contacts to, again, the finance director. He gives me that old report, and the developer helps me to extract the data from there. And we can actually use that in an automated test to test uh, the, the, the software there. So take that bit and take all the people and all their skills and swarm around the, uh, around the problem. That's the way to work in a group, isn't it? That's unbelievable. After that day, we went for a beer and... Oh my God, wow, how good are we, isn't it? So about, about Big Ben, you probably know, huh? a uh, couple of millions of years ago, there was a Big Ben, not Big Ben, Big Bang, Big Bang, and that created the world, and we we're actually quite lucky, huh? Somehow the world was formed, the universe was formed, the world was formed, and we, we are here now. But unfortunately, that worked once quite brilliantly. Unfortunately, normally, in real world, in a project, it doesn't work. You normally just hurt yourself, isn't it? So if you wait with everything, and if you analyze everything up front, and at the end, you try to bring it to the customer, quite often, that's the, that's the pain situation then. So many bugs, so many feedback is actually coming. So what, what is the problem behind that? 
I think, yeah, that's, that's somehow natural because users are not able to express all their needs and, and uh, what, what they, what they, they desire. And even for you, if you're even just a, such a brilliant analyst, you can't, you can't really face everything up front. You, you, of course, we try to think through stuff, but sometimes it's just limited. It's just not possible. And why should you? And maybe the team has already implemented quite a good system, and, and, but you can't know that because you haven't showed it to the users. So the approach is a bit to have this constant co collaboration where you communicate quite often between the team and the stakeholders. And the team yeah, fulfills work, huh? pushes work to the stakeholders, um, shows what, what they're doing, and the stakeholders actually are adding more, more things. So it doesn't make sense to, put, to, to get everything in to, to do everything. So here someone, quite often it's called a PO, maybe it's a board, decision board, who says, no, we don't do that. Yes, we do this. And you can imagine you as a business analyst, you were a guy who, who likes to facilitate, talk to people, have a chat with that team, have a chat with the stakeholders, help this guy uh, bring, it, uh, bring things in here. So you are the guy in between. You, you perfectly fit in that picture. And that actually, that generates customer value, isn't it? So over time, over time, uh, the customer value increases. Normally in the beginning of a project, you have kind of a knowledge phase. So you, so you learn, sorry, my thumb was struggling. Uh, you learn, it, it's, it's, yeah, my thumb struggled on that line. Huh? You learn. And then you really perform. Huh? There's a phase, there's always a phase where you really bring value, bring value. And then quite often in project, it ends up in somehow comes flat and oh, okay, well, we have now achieved all the, you know, this 2080 rule. Huh? We have now achieved most of the thing. Now the boring stuff is coming. But maybe you can actually trim that tail and say, well, dear users, do you think it's actually already enough? I said, oh yeah. Actually, I can already do my job, so I don't need that fancy report monthly for whatever reason. That's okay. You can actually stop. We don't have to spend more money on the project. Wow, isn't that great? Huh? And that comes because you have constant collaboration with, with the users, get the feedback. Oh my God. So, that was about the big ban, or even not the big ban, huh? Not big ban. I'm living in London now. Yeah, that's more realistic for me, the big band and big bang. So adapt. Um, next topic. You might wonder, okay, great. Uh, this guy is talking about Agile, is talking about Scala, uh, Scala is talking about uh, Scrum, Kanban. Can we just not take that as a recipe and, and apply it? Well, unfortunately, yeah, it's not that easy. Sorry, sorry. Uh, again, huh? Well, what's the cause? What's the root cause behind that? Well, quite often we, we deal with complex problems. Projects are complex. Huh? We have many, many stakeholders with many wishes. Huh? We have, sorry, I haven't read an order in that, in the, on that picture. We have a huge number of var variables or uh, factors. They were called factors on the first day. We have a huge number and they, they're tight coupled. So there are formulas in between them. It's quite hard to, to face it, uh, to see it. The, the context is changing, and quite often it happens that you do something, it has an effect, uh, but you can't really predict that from the beginning. You normally see it afterwards. And if you, ha if you have this situation, say, wow, yeah, if we would have known that before, or in hindsight we could have it done better and stuff like this. So if you hear, hear that this kind of words, then you know you're dealing with a complex problem, because normally it's not possible in the beginning to do that. So there, behind that is, is a bit of, is a model as well. Uh, Dave Snowden, I think it's not the whistleblower, isn't it? No, I think not. Uh, he came up with that model in 1999, the Cinefin framework, and he basically categorized everything or all the problems in simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic ones. So simple is a kind of making baking scones. Huh? Well, okay, you can sense, categorize, do that. Huh? Complicated are probably, well, let's say, uh, building a house. Huh? Um, 
that is probably a bit more complicated. Building a website with a web shop, maybe, huh? that's complicated. But that's still something that you can actually analyze, think about it, what is needed to fulfill the, the requirements you have there. Huh? So we, we, we can somehow face complicated process or complicated uh, products. But when it comes to complex things like I don't know, an application to um, design st a steam engine, engine uh, that's probably really complex or there you have a lot of factors uh, who are going, coming in here. And there you can't really predict from the beginning what's going to happen. So you have to uh, try to figure out what's going to happen, get feedback and respond. And when it comes to chaotic things, well, just imagine yourself uh, first time competing in a Slalom World Cup huh, with all the protector and you're at the front of that on that race and you have to go down there. Huh? Maybe that leads to, if you're not a skier, if you are a skier, that's probably not a problem, but if you're not a skier, that's maybe a chaotic situation, isn't it? Okay, so we, I mean, agile or not agile, plan driven, but obviously a simple project or a simple problem would be just silly to do that in an agile way, huh? Imagine baking scones in an agile way, having iteration, huh? Well, I don't know, do first the first layer, then a the second one. Everyone would laugh about, about you, huh? And even, even in this area, well, mm, there's somehow, I mean, building a house in an agile way, mm, it's probably a plan-driven way, isn't it? Well, although, I, Builders just had to replace our roof, so it's also kind of a, a next iteration. Huh? We got a new roof, so somehow, well, yeah, it's probably more than here that you actually start with pre-projects and then do the projects. It's a kind of face-oriented, like RUP. RUP is quite a good model for, for doing here and here. But up here, it's really hard to do that this way. So here, uh, probably the agile ways, getting feedback, looking what happened after a while, probe later on uh, what, what has happened and respond on the changes. That's probably the way to do it. But of course, you have to adapt even that, that way. We have best practices here, good practices, and here somehow you have to figure out how you deal with this. If you see we have problems with the finance director all the time that he doesn't, he isn't able to give you test data for your system, well, somehow you have to learn a way to, to get this data. So to remember, in a complex project environment, there is no plan-driven solution. And with your team, what you can actually do, study agile processes, learn best practices, and then adapt them to your situation. Never, actually, you can't really put in Scrum or Kanban or whatever. It's always a learning. And that's great. I mean, we saw uh, a couple of log yesterday or the day before, we saw even uh, case studies where they said, well, actually, yeah, we started to learn, we had Yammer or one of these uh, social tools within the company and we learned from each other. Well, that's great, that's just the way, yeah? Do that iteratively and incrementally. Again, it's not a big ban. Also here, it's not a big ban. I said big ban again, oh my God. <laughs> okay, well, from Westminster then up to that one. Um, information is not knowledge. What does it mean? What is knowledge? Uh, knowledge is kind of linking information items, huh? make information networks accessible, apply knowledge and create value. It's, it's somehow in, in, a, in a certain context it's applicable. Huh? So knowledge you know you have from work, it's probably not applicable at home, stuff like this. But if you look at it, we quite often think information is knowledge. So an example could be uh, writing an email. Huh? You have a help system for your, your email system. So you can actually uh, open that. Uh, there's described how you do that. You can even have a checklist for um, gratings and so. So you could actually explicit use that knowledge out of that information document and do your job. Imagine that you sit down. OK, I have to write an email. Here's the checklist help system. OK, open that application. Well, okay, I see it. Click on that button. Email opens. Okay, I have to fill in an address here. I have the address, put it in. Okay, then uh, introduction or greeting. Okay, formal, informal, yes, formal. Okay, dear sir, madam, 
and then, okay, text. Well, okay, now it starts to get, get hard, huh? So what we have, actually, what we have, what, we, what makes us really productive is the tacit knowledge. You probably learn that once and you see it from others and then you achieve this tacit knowledge, this volatile thing, this, this implicit knowledge about it in your brain and that, that makes it so, so performant, so, so eff efficient. And that's the way we should actually, oops, sorry again, we should actually solve such complex problems. That's the way. It, it's also called knowledge worker and I actually have stolen this, these slides from Rainer Grau, he's also working for Silke. Um, but I think that's a, that's a common, or there are studies about knowledge workers uh, out there. So you, you actually try to identify knowledge gaps. I always struggle with uh, the introduction, so I, I, I see that knowledge gap and I learn what kind of uh, in introductions I can actually use in an email. So I learn that. I get feedback, well, your introduction was wrong, huh? Okay, well, I learned that, how to do that better. You iterative, you learn together, you experiment. I always said, uh, there's a Swiss thing, uh, hello together. We say in Swiss or in German, hello zusammen means hello together. Well, that's just so wrong in English, isn't it? Yeah, hello everyone. So I just experimented with it quite a couple of times and someone said, well, that's wrong. So I learned from that. Um, so, really, if you take something out of that talk, it's that one oh, down here. Huh? So, knowledge is context specific, it's acquired in the heads of people, tacit and cherished knowledge is the efficient form of knowledge, and sorry, but yeah, documentation of any form holds just information and not knowledge. So, if you think we can put information into a document and someone else can just pick it up, that, that has just a cost, isn't it? So this kind of, um, we do a, a knowledge transfer, just, just write everything down and the next one can pick it up. <clears throat> well, yeah, documentation is just information. Knowledge is something that you have in your head. So then the next truth. Um, silos are for farmers, not for projects. Farmers store uh, grain, store food, uh, for, for animals in, in, in silos. They would actually never store uh, livestock in there, wouldn't they? But why on earth that we always find ourselves within a silo? I wouldn't say uh, WWF or Greenpeace is not really happy about uh, storing uh, livestock in a silo. I'm not sure Amnesty International would be actually really happy if we, if we see each other in put into silo as well. But in projects, we actually, it's quite often uh, like this, isn't it? So you're the business analyst, you, you write the specification, huh? within your own little knowledge cloud, you push it over, somehow over a fence, over the silo border, into a next one. <coughs> well, my architect normally sits in an ivy tower, so it's not probably not a silo, he's the lucky guy, huh? he sits somewhere in the ivy tower. He writes a software architecture document gives it to the development, gives it to the test, and then deployment puts it into a product. And somewhere up here is a product manager. Huh? And everyone has his own little knowledge around here. And somehow you transfer it over email, over specifications. I don't know, strange. Would it not be better to be all on the same pasture, all on the same, out there in the green? Huh? Cows quite like that. How great would it be to work on that complex problem together, have this common knowledge about it, have this product vision behind it? Huh? Maybe the, the, the product owner, uh, project manager is responsible for the product vision. You as a, a specialist in analyzing, you are contributing to all the, all the documents somehow related to specifications. Uh, other specialists, maybe the tester, helps you then actually to work out test cases for it. He, he quite often communicates with you. So you all work together and you, you produce value for the, for the customer. So do you remember, uh, you can't just document knowledge again huh? uh, and build up tacit knowledge in your team by encouraging them to learn together. Uh, that's, that's great. And of course, I mean, if you have such a team, don't split it up if, if, if not. Uh, but. <coughs> 
if it's not really required. And again, documentation is information, not knowledge. Remember that, hopefully. So, um, well, I'm an action photographer as well, and we just learned in the last workshop that my business model is so crap. I have a lot, <laughs> I have a lot of, of expenses, but I don't really earn something. I, don't, I make it always for free, so yeah. So uh, it happens to me, actually, that I'm in a place like this at the Prudential Ride in, in London, and you see all them chaining up, huh, uh, drafting each other in, in a race. So they try to stay as close as possible. And that's somehow applicable for business as well. And I tell you the story about bubbles. Uh, think of, of information uh, as, as bubbles. And that's the way that you actually learn and perform best if you're in the same room with your customer and the rest of the team. So these bubbles, huh, they bubble around. Can you say bubble around? OK, well, I used the, the verb huh, bubble around. Uh, maybe the product owner uh, is on the phone with someone, and somehow you, you get wind of that information. So these bubbles coming through, huh, you work together. Please help me with that. OK, another guy learns about it. And so these bubbles all float around within the same room. So now introducing walls, huh? different offices. Well, you see, actually, the bubbles, they are quite, well, they have it hard to get into the next room. And even if someone sits in here, the project manager, well, he never gets the bubbles from, from his team up here, isn't it? And then the extreme form, well, you are in another location. huh? Your bubbles are here. This poor bubbly bubbly here up there. huh? gets no information at all. Uh, unfortunately, in, in real world, we quite often deal with distributed team, isn't it? So we have a, a development center somewhere else, offshoring, whatsoever. So there you have to try to be really creative, creative and, and use technology we have. So put up a couple of monitors, have webcams all over the place, or use uh, tools like Jira, version one, whatever, for, for planning. Try to do pair programming, pair sessioning, even show your monitor to, to people somewhere far away. Uh, then do also retrospectives in kind of facilitated way, live meeting, Google Docs, whatever. Be creative. And really important is from time to time you should meet in person, isn't it? That's so <laughs> valuable to, to, to have a beer with someone uh, and work later on with that guy. That's, that's much more a relationship that we anyway, yeah, we as a business analyst, we, we like to have this relationship thing, isn't it? So kickoffs, hackathon, this kind of things. Um, well, yeah, the problem is as well, if you have these bubbles, the bubble producer quite often, the, the, the customers somewhere else, well, that's also a big problem. And we have actually an, an, own, um, an own section for that. So the product owner we see somehow as this representative of the customer. Well, you might ask yourself, is that my job? Mm, um, yeah, could be, but there are some problems. Huh? So what are the responsibilities of a product owner? He somehow is, is owner of a vision, of a roadmap, of a budget. He tried to produce value, huh? cost structure, business model, features. He has to produce user stories, backlog. He collaborates, and he somehow has to be empowered to make decisions. Well, that sounds really like a superhero, isn't it? Um, so could we be that superhero? Could we be that? And the bubble says, actually, we, we care about organizational goals, about stakeholders. We, we produce, we create real value. Uh, so we have actually some kind of tool set already, and we do kind of support this. Uh, but quite often, we're trained to focus on, on, on details. Uh, can we really focus on, on the big picture over, overall, over, over all the, the projects? Um, can we delegate our work? I think, yeah, we are quite good in writing down requirements. Not all, not all. I wouldn't say that at all. But we, we quite like it to go into the details, into the requirements. <laughs> Um, and are we really able to plan releases and, and do stuff like this? And can we prioritize stakeholder priorities? Can we stay, prioritize uh, the requirements they bring in? I'm not sure, probably not. Probably that someone 
else who is doing that. And if you end in that situation and you are, as the business analyst, the product owner uh, in that situation, you're kind of a proxy product owner. You, you do a lot, you bring in a lot, you market plan, but to make the real decision, you always have to run back to your boss. Oh, can I do that? Can you give me the, uh, the power to do that? It's always this back and forth, which makes you not so efficient. So I think personally, uh, there should be a kind of a product owner. Maybe it's a group who decides on things. But you are actually the, the guy who produces material, who talks to the people who produces these stories and these kind of things, facilitates workshops. So I think you're not the product owner, but you're his best buddy, his, the guy who does the work, kind of. Does that make sense? Hmm? It's a vague team, I know. It's, it's quite hard, and I think nobody really out there has really found uh, the, the proper solution. And if you talk to Ken Schwaber, he thinks, well, yeah, that should be really a person, but a lot of others say, well, no, it's probably not true. And I'm, I'm, I haven't found it. Uh, the right solution yet. I found it best if you have some kind of people who can decide and you work with them together to, to achieve something. So and the last thing I actually have up here is working with stories. Kind of stories are this day some kind of new requirements. Huh? You have probably seen this, this, this thing. So as a teacher I want to upgrade grades online so that I no longer depend on administrators to do it for me. That's a story. Huh? And you have acceptance criteria. I can add degrees for all subjects in a syllabus. I can add grades from my office computer or my notebook at home connected to my university network. That's a kind of, that's a better story here. Huh? And that gives some more flesh on that bone. Um, the pattern is a bit, you have a person, you have their goals, and you somehow try quite often to write down as well the business benefit, the value that something like this, this feature, would actually create. And this criteria actually here gives the bone. So quite often it happens, okay, so you write something like this down on a sticky, huh? you work it out, and then you see, okay, well, obviously here we, have, we are talking about two things. We have subjects, we have the scope, uh, what's, what's in the syllabus, but we also talk about distributed, um, we have it from the office computer and from your network. You probably split, split that down into two stories. But I think personally, yeah, this work with stories, it's something that is really nice for us. Again, we are fancy about stories uh, or we are fancy about post-its. Having workshop facilitate that. And quite often we, we tend to yeah, do it in, a, in such a visual way. And sketching things with customers on a wall with all these stories, that's just great, isn't it? You, you actually see the picture and, and they see the picture on the wall. Um, you can bring this, these things in order so you can actually group topics together, abstract it to epics, huh? and then even business people can work with these epics. Uh, you can, all kinds of things, dependings, uh, dependencies, sources, hints you can write down. Uh, and as I said, you can actually split them uh, into parts. And of course, if you like, you can actually put everything into an electronic system if that is required. So here, an example of, of such, a, such a work. You see, we have a lot of stories created. Huh? We have bundled them into epics, which is on a higher level. Um, and then over the time, we, we actually tried to see what is really necessary. So which stories are really necessary to bring our product into the air? Huh? These are the necessary ones. And here, everything which is up here is less optional and here more optional. So we already can see, well, to, to show you quickly something, we might could focus first on these things up here, which are really necessary. <coughs> but we assure you, in, in the next release or in the third release, you get the, the nice things you want to have it as well. Huh? But really, currently we focus on that and we bring flesh on the bone in this area up here. So that's from a real world um, a storyboard. Um, if you need to be really formal, actually, you can use a model like RAM. It's a requirements abstraction model. And we saw that yesterday uh, at lunch as well, there are more, more ones. Uh, safe, scale, agi agility framework, dis discipline, agility, 
disciplined, agile delivery. So they're all kind of a bit the same. So you, you probably end up somewhere with stories, you group them to epics, upwards it goes abstracted to themes, maybe business visions, and here actually we are going, we're coming up to the business. Huh? So on C level, they probably talk about this ones. They probably talk about portfolio management uh, on, on, on that level. But we still can break it downwards, down to tasks on a component or functional level for executing in, in a project. Um, you also see with that, that way that you actually can uh, figure out if you are doing kind of gold plating. So if you follow the rule and say, well, everything which I create here as a story, and, and customer quite often think in that way and say, well, yeah, as, an, as a teacher, I want to do this or that. Um, so is there an epic? Is there a vision up here somewhere in the business? And if there isn't, it's maybe gold plating. It's maybe something that is not required to, to uh, implement this vision. And vice versa as well, if you have an epic, if you have abstracted stories up to an epic and you see, well, okay, uh, we have the, the teacher, but do we probably need as well administrators or something else as well? So you can actually break it downwards as well and figure out if there is, is things, if stuff is missing. So, yeah, that's about it. Um, I talked about the Agile Manifesto, two frameworks, Big Ben, Adapt, information is not knowledge. Silos are performers, stay close, product owners, stories. And it was really great to talk to you before my talk and I think even afterwards, because I already have a lot of topics for, for next year, so I could actually come up with 10 more things about Agile. Uh, let me know, I probably forgot to write my email down in the presentation, so here it is. Yes, I'm done. Bring my horse and I go home. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah.